I'm Jamie Anderson. My father is Jerry Anderson, and you might know him better as the creator of Thunderbirds, Stingray, Captain Scarlet, and many other shows. Ten years ago, Dad was driving me and a friend into Fulham, and his lane positioning was absolutely dreadful to the point where we all had white knuckles in the car because we were so terrified. But as a teenager, you don't want to say anything to your dad to say, you know, your driving's awful, Dad, what's going on? Bits and pieces to do with spatial awareness got worse and worse. And then about five or six years ago, Terry Pratchett got involved with the Alzheimer's Society. And they did a documentary on Terry's form of Alzheimer's, which is a very specific visual form called PCA. Um, and in that, Terry explained making visual errors. So dad would lose a, lose a number on the telephone. So if he was dialing an area code and it was 01491, he would go 014 and then hesitate for a minute or two over the nine because he sort of temporarily lost the concept of the number nine and what it looked like. Um, but even then, Mum and I just put it down to normal ageing. We, we could have kept making excuses. And even when he made soup with the dog's antifungal shampoo, we still said, oh, well, it's just a mistake. Any, any older person could make it. It's totally normal. Um, but at that stage, I started to say to mum, come on, there's something really odd here. And I looked up more and more about it. And it did seem just like Terry's form of Alzheimer's. Um, and yeah, it, it just became more and more obvious, but it still took another couple of years after that point to get a diagnosis. My wife dragged me, because I said, you know, I don't want to make a fuss, nothing's wrong. Oh yes, there is something wrong. And she took me to the local doctor who gave me a brief examination and said, we need to have a look at this more carefully in a hospital. When they got the results, it showed that I had, in fact, contracted Alzheimer. Shortly after he was diagnosed, we talked really openly about what was going to happen and how the disease progresses. And I had to be kind of frank with him and say his cognitive function, his brain function was going to decline more and more as we went on. So at that point, he kind of thought work is no longer an option, really, although he still thinks about it occasionally. So I thought what would be something productive for him to do? And Dad is well known in some circles. He you know, made this show in the 60s and other shows through the 70s and stuff that people know now. And, and the most important thing I thought was that people that were fans of the show when it was originally transmitted are those who could be diagnosed now or are most likely to be, or their parents, in fact. So I spoke to him and I thought, he's going to be really resistant to this. He's going to hate it. He doesn't want to tell everybody about this diagnosis because he's so upset about it. But actually, his response was the opposite, and he really wanted to get involved and do something positive with it. I phoned the Alzheimer's Society, and they decided they'd like him to front their Memory Walk campaign this year. So Memory Walk is their flagship charity event. Three, two, one. Events like this are so important to get the charity's name out there for everybody's awareness to know what it's all about. I'm doing it in memory of my dad who unfortunately passed away with Alzheimer's. Sue did the walk for her mum who's just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's recently. I did the walk today for my granddad. I've done it in memory of my mum who I lost two years ago. I don't know if my dad, before my dad's got Alzheimer's, I didn't really know much about it. I just thought it was someone who'd lost their memory, really, and didn't really know what sort of went on. Um, but it's opened my eyes a little bit to it, so I thought, let's just try and raise a bit of money to help everyone else that's been in my situation. I want to do this for Jerry Anderson, particularly, because he's given me so much. Most of us have got lots of memories, and it's so sad when those memories get corrupted. I'm supporting Jerry Anderson because he's got Alzheimer's and uh, gets very upset. 
my mother-in-law had Alzheimer's. Uh, she was diagnosed when she was 50, but we had her for 10 years, and it was a very progressive disease, and you learn a lot. And one thing that was important was that being an actor, my wife being an opera singer, uh, we knew how to play the game. We never corrected her. We never said that she was wrong. If she said the sky was green, we'd say, yes, it has been green for a little while. We just went on with it. You know, I'm just thankful I wake up every morning and I know who I am. Some people don't have that choice. Just a little word about that extra mile you can do. I live an hour and a half away. I'm not here all the time, um, although I probably should be. There's certainly a, a degree of guilt that I'm not here 24-7 because that's what mum has to deal with. Um, I think to start with it wasn't so bad because although he lost his driving license early on, he, he wasn't that bad behaviourally, but certainly in the last six months he's got really upset, anxious, aggressive, paranoid, and all these are hallmarks of, of moderate Alzheimer's disease. And she's had to deal with that every day, every night. He gets up at two, three, four o'clock in the morning. She has to get up, settle him down, send him back to bed. What you want to do is to say, no, you're being silly, you know, it's, it's the disease. It's not, you know, <laughs> the problem is the Alzheimer's, but you can't explain that to him. You just have to go with it and comfort as much as you can not, and not challenge him because challenging is the worst thing because that leads to aggression and more anxiety and the whole thing gets worse. The further the disease goes on, the more dad loses his biographical memory. So his memory of everything that's happened during his life and it, and it's gone from recent times and is now going back through maybe the 70s and the late 60s. So anything that's happened since then is erased, basically, or certainly very confused. So since my birth was in that area, he now doesn't remember that I'm his son. And he certainly lost the concept of a father-son relationship and what that means. So I think because I look similar, unfortunately, the hair, uh, and because I'm slightly taller than him, he refers to me sometimes as, as his big brother. Um, but he'll quite often ask me, who are you to me? And we have a, a long protracted com conversation about the fact that I'm his son. Um, and it can sometimes take him a long time to even vaguely get, get a grip of that. And then it will go again very quickly too. So we just kind of accept that sometimes I'm brother, big brother, that bloke, whatever he wants to call me is fine. Unfortunately, uh, matters have got much worse since, since uh, we, we realised that it was Alzheimer, uh, uh, um, and uh, I decided I would have to do my best. My big brother made sure that I was getting the right drugs and uh, Mary, my wife, made sure that I was taking the right drugs. And uh, I took my medicines like a, a little boy. And bugger all has happened. <laughs> the treatment that he's had has been not very effective at all. You know, if we'd caught it a few years earlier and if we'd started this treatment say three years earlier probably now he might even be at the stage where he's still working um, and now we're looking at full-time care options for him it's got that bad and it's that much of a difference that's just been made by holding off and trying to maintain his pride you know it's, uh, it's made a huge dent in his independence and we've lost more and more of the guy that I used to call dad. You know, he's, n he's no longer there because we left it for so long. So don't leave it. You have to sort of, you know, tackle it and be a bit tough about it. I don't think people outside of the people who've got it re re really know much about it. Nobody in the family ever had anything like it before, so um, it was a bit of a shock and a massive big learning curve for us. But um, yeah, I just, just feel it's a really good cause now. The walk is the beginning of me trying to find out what I can do to help Mum, because it's a little bit of a minefield. Um, always getting to the right place, the right help, the right everything else. 
We want to do I it mean. with family support. I'm <laughs> awful. You're not awful. Well, yeah, she is. <laughs> There's obviously like the Alzheimer's Society, but there's Help the Aged. There's all these people that that were, you know that are there to help and support you. And I think as a family, you need that support and you need that help. Um, my granddad had Alzheimer's for um, nearly 12 years. Um, we watched him go from a really healthy, fit man to when he retired, gradually losing losing his mind really and losing all sense of who we are and um, the last seven years of his life he spent in a nursing home and there needs to be so much research to be done there's so many people getting it and it's getting more and more common. There's a few Alzheimer's charities around but their focus is on research which is fantastic because the main thing is we want to cure it or find a way of predictably preventing it. The drug treatments we have work okay for some people, but not for everyone. And all they do is they slow it down, they don't reverse anything, and they certainly don't halt it. So the research is obviously really, really important, but realistically, even if something was found tomorrow, that's not gonna reach the market for 10 years from now. So in the meantime, what about all the people that are suffering and their families? Um, there's a, a huge lack of knowledge around. People don't know what it is. They don't know the difference between Alzheimer's and normal aging and there's very little support for people who are caring, and caring is a full-time job. It's been totally 24-7 for mum, um, and if it weren't for the Alzheimer's Society, there would be nobody to give essential information, to give support, to organise activities and social stuff for Alzheimer's sufferers and the carers. There is a wide ranging services we can provide for people. We have a dementia support workers. Um, these can um, provide one-to-one -one support for people at home. We have activity groups such as Singing for the Brain, um, and that's where people can get together and enjoy some singing in a round. Sing, sing together. It's discovered that singing was one of the things that helped people with Alzheimer's. The singing also is something that they didn't lose in their memories. They remembered the songs that they had before. We see people come along and the first time they come along, they sit with their carer, their husband, their wife, and they sit very quietly. And after a couple of weeks, they start to get into it and they join in. And it's really lovely to see the reaction that they get and to see them smiling and uh, enjoying it. I think we are beginning to beat down the stigma of dementia um, because there is still an awful lot of fear out in the community about what, what dementia is and how people can deal with it. At the end of the day, what we're trying to say to people, you need to remember the person, not the dementia, focus on the person. So there has been changes. I think we've grown in recognition um, and we are doing you know, more and more work with local communities. Pick it up, put it on the other knee. As far as we're concerned, when, when it's, we're talking about people that have known Dad through the industry, um, there's been a real polarisation in response. Either they've disappeared, um, avoided him as much as possible, and that could be because he's had an aggressive outburst at them due to the disease, or it could be just because they heard the diagnosis and thought, ooh, don't like the sound of that, and they've walked away. On the other hand, luckily, there's been a few who have been excellent and they keep in touch, they take him out when they can, they, you know, they keep talking to him about old times that he remembers. And things like that have been really, really, really important. It was a shock finding that Jerry had got Alzheimer's. Um, and, I, and I think like a lot of people, your, your immediate reaction is just to write somebody off um, because they're gonna forget everything straight away. They're not gonna make any sense. Um, and the surprise has been that you know, Jerry has good days, he has bad days. He's still able to talk about his productions and very proud of them. The fans give me a great deal of support. I'm not talking about, here's a tenor, Jerry, go and buy yourself an ice cream. You know, they, they inquire, how am I doing? How do I feel? Am I going to such and such a meeting? Have you read an article in da, 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 da. just in every way you can think? If there's anything they can do to help, they do. When the Alzheimer's Society wanted uh, props, puppets, etc., for the photo shoots to launch, launch the walks, 
suddenly lots of people jumped in and volunteered and they were really helpful and little things like that make a huge difference. I was asked back at the beginning of the, the walks if I would help promote it with Virgil. So as I've got my puppet Virgil, why not? Seems like a good idea. We've also had offers from various members to take that out, drive him around if he can't get to places. And obviously we're getting a huge amount of support for this walk in, in Windsor. Um, so I think, yeah, they, they've been really, really supportive. Certainly a lot of them have sponsored me for my endeavours for walking the marathons, and we really do appreciate it. It was some time before somebody actually answered a direct question of mine, uh, which was, um, uh, is it uh, terminal? Of course, the answer is, it is terminal. But... Um, Surprising how you get used to things in life. Uh, I suppose one thing that helps me is that uh, we're all terminal, I'm not the only one. <laughs> so from that point of view, I, I thought, don't feel sorry for yourself. All these people are, are terminal as well, so anyway. Dad was hoping to make an appearance at the Windsor Memory Walk, which we launched originally earlier in 2012 uh, but his his disease just progressed so much quicker than any of us had thought he was getting really lost at home waking up and not knowing where he was and things were getting a lot more upsetting for him and for for mum and mum was struggling to cope when we explained to him he was at home he would feel frightened I think frightened that he didn't know that this is the place he'd lived at um, for for 20 years. For a long time he'd said that he wanted to go into a, a care home where he could be looked after 24-7 and that was a pretty difficult time. Even going down there he was f switching every five minutes between knowing where we were going and saying what's happening. And you could just see the level of confusion um, and even then he was starting to sort of lose his appetite and lose the sense of thirst and he declined more and more rapidly. Uh, through October and November and by December he had to be moved up to a, a nursing ward for 24-hour care. Um, at that stage we got a few warnings from staff and, um, and the doctors looking after him that he really didn't have very long left because people just can't survive that long without food and water. Um, I went and saw him on Christmas Eve, um, wished him a Merry Christmas. By that time he was really not, not talking at all and not really aware of his surroundings. And uh, unfortunately, I got the call on Boxing Day morning that he died. The creator of Thunderbirds, Jerry Anderson, has died at the age of 83. He created some of the best known and most loved children's programmes of the 60s and 70s. Mr Anderson had been suffering from dementia for the past two years and he died in his sleep. His name was trending on Twitter and hundreds of thousands of mentions on Facebook, every news channel, every paper, everything which was really touching. It just sort of reaffirmed how much of a, a global effect his productions had had and how many kids he'd entertained worldwide. Um, he and we were, were worried that when he did die that people wouldn't, wouldn't notice. They'd just go, they, you know, they might hear about it, but they wouldn't really care. But the, uh, the public response was totally the opposite. And then we had people like Jonathan Ross, Eddie Izzard, Brian Blessed, Brian Cox, um, you know, a whole load of celebrities saying, you know, how much his shows had meant to them as well. Um, and that just compounded this sort of amazing way that the, that the news spread uh, and the way that the sort of the thanks and, uh, and grateful sentiments were generated. Back in April 2012, Dad and I were chatting and he asked if Alzheimer's disease was terminal and we were, we were always very honest about everything, and I said, yes, if you get that far, it is. There's often other complications, but yes, in essence, it is terminal. And that neatly led on to funeral discussion, um, which he was quite frank about. Mum said, uh, what we'll do is have a, a private family service and then a, a more public memorial afterwards. And he looked horrified. Uh, and he said, I don't want that. I want a big public send-off, I want everyone to be there, I want everyone to, to know what I did and to be able to celebrate and have a damn good time. So that was slightly unexpected, uh, but that's exactly what he wanted and that's exactly what we tried to plan. 
there were people stood outside under the shelter there. We had about 350 to turn up in the end, which was a great turnout. I had this coffin top with a Floral Thunderbird 2 tribute, which again is what we discussed and what he would have wanted. People came away saying, that's the best funeral I've ever been to, which it, it sounds a bit odd in a way, but it was really good. It's, you know, the whole point was it was a celebration. It was a humanist celebration of his life and, and everything that he'd done. What one man can do to spread a lot of joy, a lot of mirth, a break down barriers. He did it all, and it's an extraordinary feat. I, I don't know how many people are here, but there is an amazing amount. This speaks for itself, this kind of gathering, and the tribute and the numbers, it's great. Jerry was inspirational, and I think you'll find that you talk to anyone here. He was a great innovator, uh, and uh, he built a, a fantastic team around him, and uh, he sat at the apex of this team, and he had a huge influence on entertainment, and entertaining the young especially. I was, I mean, I was glad to be here today. I think he would have approved too. Uh, a lovely man. Jerry was really quite embarrassed by it all because he just thought he was doing a job and he didn't really understand why so much attention. Um, but I think, quietly, he'd be quite chuffed that, that he'd made such an impact in so many people's lives. The last public appearance he'd made was at the London Memory Walk for Alzheimer's Society. You could see on the day he was really, really struggling, but he made a really good show of it and did a, a funny speech at the start and uh, you know had his photo taken a few people and he was you know he was really on form for the for the day and then on the way back he was really he was really down about it you know he he said i'm getting worse aren't i i can i can feel i'm getting worse every day um and that was the first time he really really said that and been really honest about it so that was you know really upsetting to hear um and he said what can we do and I said, well, we've already done lots, you know, you've, you've fronted all these memory walk campaigns and, you know, they've raised lots of money and had more entrance than all, you know, they've ever had before. And it's all been great. And he said, well, yeah, but what can I do going forward? Um, and I said, well, there's, there are sort of tissue donation programs that you can do. Um, and uh, he said, well, you know, surely they should just have my brain then. Which, again, took me back a little bit. Um, we'd not really discussed anything like that. I know we talked about the funeral, um, which was odd in itself, but then someone living saying, I want my brain to go uh, to research was pretty amazing. It's nice in a way that he's still doing something almost proactively after he's gone. A posthumous proactive act is pretty difficult to, to pull off and he's done that. That brain is right now being looked at and having a pathology report done it, which will help to develop drugs, treatments, and to better understand how the disease progresses. So, yeah, a pretty amazing gesture. I would hope that people will see the part that he's played. They'll see that as a catalyst for people becoming more aware and Alzheimer's disease being something that we actually talk about without the stigma attached, because that's really what he did. He sort of, he, he came out about his diagnosis, despite the stigma. Um, and managed to sort of step over the stigma and just carry on. Um, and I, I hope that that is, is something that people really strongly associate with him.